Tonight's big story is a 49-year-old Filipino caregiver has been confirmed as the third fatality in the war in Israel, while dozens of others await repatriation. Israel prepares for a ground offensive into Gaza. Could the Philippines lose its gold medal over Justin Brownlee testing positive for a prohibited substance? That's been all the chatter on social media today. We'll discuss that with sports lawyer attorney Miki Ingles and sports nutrition coach Jeanette Aro. And another government agency gets hacked. This time around, the Department of Science and Technology confirmed that they had a data leak involving a nationwide registry of science experts. Welcome to the show. I'm Regina Lane. I'm Gretchen Ho. And I'm Sean Yao. Well, girls, we had Coach Al Francis here last night. Mm -hmm. We were celebrating the Asian gold. We didn't expect this. Yeah. Uh, on the news uh, this morning, kickstarting our day was shocking news about Pilas Filipina star Justin Brown Lee. Social media was on fire today after the International Testing Agency announced late last night that Brown Lee had failed an anti doping test in the recently concluded Asian Games in Hangzhou, China. Well, here's everything we know. The ITA reported that a sample collected from Brownlee returned an adverse analytical finding for carboxy THC. This is a specified prohibited substance according to the prohibited list of the World Anti-Doping Agency. Carboxy THC is typically linked to cannabis use. The agency added that Brownlee was tested last October 7, a day after their win over Jordan in the finals, with the China Anti-Doping Agency collecting his sample. To be clear, it is not unusual for an athlete to get tested after a competition. Brownlee has since been informed of the result and was granted the right to request an analysis of the B samples. So the obvious question now is, what's next? Well, firstly, according to the ITA, the case will be forwarded to the Anti-Doping Division of the Court of Arbitration for Sport for adjudication under the OCA Anti-Doping Rules. Next, Brownlee can still appeal and ask for an alternate analysis as covered by the Athletes' Anti-Doping Rights Act of the OCA. Under this, the 35-year-old forward can also exercise his rights to fair testing programs, medical treatment and protection of health rights, right to justice, and right to data protection, among others. But for now, Brownlee is part of the list of athletes released by ITA who are either serving a provisional suspension or other sanctions as a consequence of an anti-doping rule violation. Also on that list is Filipina cyclist Ariana Evangelista, who failed an anti-doping test last September 23. Eight other athletes are also listed, including Sami Bizay of Jordan, whom Gilas competed against in the gold medal match. But the question on every mi everyone's minds is, what will happen to the country's gold medal? According to the OCA anti-doping regulations, there are separate instructions for athletes participating in individual sports and those in team sports. In Brownlee's case, of course, he falls under the category of team sports. Should Article 11.2 serve as the reference point, there may be no obligation for Gilas to give back the gold medal. Well, Philippine Olympic Committee President Bambol Tolentino has already confirmed that their office, along with Brownlee, received the notice last night. According to Tolentino, Brownlee and the Samahang Basketball and Pilipinas, or SBP, will have until October 9 to file an appeal. Yung move naman nila, ni Brownlee, ng SBP, and, uh, may deadline naman yan eh, hanggang 19, to, to submit kung acknowledging all and waiving their rights to appeal or to waiving their rights to open the sample B then if positive again, uh, if they will appeal. Now here's something, something to take note of about the samplings. If the A sample turns out to be positive for the prohibited substance, an athlete may request an analysis of his or her B sample. An athlete could then also waive the right to test the B sample and just appeal. If the B sample does not confirm the A sample, 
the athlete will be allowed to participate in future competitions. Tolentino shared that the SVP is already looking into Brownlee's medication and whether it does have that carboxy THC component. Yeah, yun na ang pinag-uusapan. Hindi pa si Brownlee, no? Yung nasabi ng SVP, there, si Brownlee is in medication before pa. Kaya nga hindi nakalaro ng FIBA World Cup yun dahil uh, injured eh. Hmm. May medication siya. So, doon nila tinetrace kung baka may nainom siya na, na sa medication niya na may component. Now, what if the B sample also tests positive? Tolentino explained that they can appeal it to the Court of Arbitration for Sport and prove that Brownlee needed to take medicine that contained that prohibited component. The court will then discuss whether this is acceptable or not, meaning that the suspension can also be reduced to a month or three months. And in spite of all of this, Tolentino says the gold medal will stay with the Philippines. I think I don't gold. I, I don't think the gold medal will be uh, stripped from us. No? Kasi it's a team. It's, the, it's a team effort. Certainly, there are more, plenty more questions than answers at this point. So here to help us make sense of things, we have with us live via Zoom tonight two guests. The first is sports lawyer, attorney Mickey Inglas, and also sports nutrition coach, coach Jeanette Aro. Good evening, guys. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Good evening. Uh, Hi, good evening. Thanks for having us. Coach uh, Aro, Jeanette, uh, I'm going to go to you first. Let's uh, define terminologies exactly. What is this carboxy THC component that they're talking about? How does it usually get into the system? And why is it on the prohibited substances list? Actually, yung um, carboxy THC or tetrahydrocannabinol uh, is a byproduct of um, delta 9 THC. And then THC is derived from chemical compounds like yung, uh, yung tawag doon is cannabinoids. Yung cannabinoids nakukuha yan sa mga uh, uh, tawag nito yung uh, cannabis or marijuana in, in Tagalog. No? So ang, ang main reason kung bakit yan um, napupunta sa katawan ng isang tao is either it can be from medication or recreational use of cannabis or marijuana, or it can also come from um, passive exposure. Kunyari, nasa isang environment ka na may mga taong gumagamit ng cannabis. Pwedeng ma-expose ka doon, pwede yung pumasok sa katawan ng isang tao. And then, uh, uh, Jeanette, if you could also explain to us, as far as you know, as far as you can tell, why do you think it's on the prohibited substances list? Of, to be uh, honest, ang, ang um, THC is not really a performance-enhancing drug. It's actually an ergolytic, no? meaning it's, it can cause performance impairment. No? So, uh, mas bumabagal yung mga metabolic processes na nangyayari sa isang katawan ng isang tao kapag ka na-expose sa THC. However, in the context of sport, no? halimbawa, there is an occurrence of anxiety or stress. So, in a way, pwedeng maging uh, or makatulong makatulong sa performance ng isang athlete yung exposure sa THC by managing stress, di ba? Or managing anxiety. Mas na, in a way, uh, pwedeng mag-improve yung performance ng isang athlete in that context. But technically speaking, hindi talaga nag improve or nakaka-improve ng performance in itself, ang THC. It's just that in the context of managing anxiety and stress, mas nagiging kalmado yung isang athlete kapag ka may exposure. Coach, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the anti-doping process? Uh, the testing, uh, you are also the coach for Hydrin Diaz. Um, you're very well aware of uh, this. Um, yeah. Uh, ano ba to before after how many hours you know how many hours uh, baka ba ang na inhale lang ba si Justin Brownlee uh -oh. tell us more okay ganito kasi yung process niya no ng testing ng um, anti-doping so part of my job as uh, the nutritionist of our some of our elite athletes not only hiding but also the other three olympic medalists Tokyo olympic medalists that we have is to handle their nutrition, safe supplementation, and partly doping control through safe supplementation. So pag sinabi nating uh, doping control, um, it, it, 
encompasses the whole um, training calendar year of the athlete. So, meron tayong tinatawag dito na out-of-competition testing. Ang testing talaga ng anti-doping, hindi lang yan nangyayari sa actual na competition, but also even out of competition uh, testing randomly ginagawa yan ng mga um, doping control officer so they can visit anytime kung nasaan man yung athlete that's why athletes or elite level athletes who are under the registered testing pool should always update their whereabouts or meaning lagi nila dapat sinasabi or ina-update ang World Anti-Doping Agency or WADA kung nasaan sila di ba anong oras sila nandoon sa location na yun because they can be tested anytime anytime anywhere no within that um uh, yung yung uh, within that uh, period na kabilang sila dun sa registered testing pool now during competition they can also be randomly tested if they're not a medalist but if they are a medalist meaning nagperform sila ng maayos or podium finisher sila uh, by default they will surely be tested no so ganun na nangyayari diyan and then pag nag pag uh, nilapitan ka na ng doping control officer after a competition nandiyan na yan nakabantay sa iyo hindi ka na pwedeng umalis sa paningin nila kapag ka lumapit na sila si Loka kahit anong gawin mo halimbawa sabi mo oh magko-cool down pa ako hindi sila aalis sa tabi mo talagang titignan kanila because they have to make sure that there will be uh, no tampering of samples that may happen kasi pwedeng kung anong gawin, di ba? So, yun ang nangyayari dyan. And then, the athlete, together with uh, a coach, if requested by the athlete, they will go inside the um, doping control room wherein the samples will be taken. Okay? Kasama yung doping control officer na lumapit sa athlete. So, ano yung mga samples na kinukuha? For some sports, urine sample lang. But for other sports, for example, for weightlifting with Heidelin and... Um, yeah, with Heidelin, uh, may blood component din na kinukuha. So, two samples ang kinukuha sa weightlifting. Blood sample and then uh, urine wala, sample. Wala ang tampering after the test? <laughs> Sino kaya yung kumuha ha? nung ano? Sino yung kumuha? Alam nyo, sa totoo lang, it can't have... Pwede, ah, hindi siya pwedeng mangyari yung tampering kasi hanggang sa loob ng banyo sumasama yung doping control No, after. Office. I mean, after. <laughs> yeah, after competition. By the testing so, body. Yeah, but by the time but by the time na matapos yung competition and then you were identified as the athlete that who will be tested, the do the doping control officer will be by your side. No matter how long will it take between you being the competition area and as you go to the uh, doping control uh, or doping mm. testing room. Mm -hmm. Nandiyan right. na yan sa tabi mo, hindi na yan aalis, talaga nang abantay sa iyo. And okay. then, pagpasok mo sa banyo, nandun din. Sila din yung kukuha ng blood sample. Ganyan. And then, pag nakuha na yung sample, uh, yung urine, and then yung blood, hinahati yan into two uh, vials. Yun yun, pumapasok yung sample A and sample B. Mm -hmm. yun, na yung, yun na yung alam natin ngayon uh, okay. na case ni, uh, ni Justin. Alright, Attorney Inglas, ikaw naman. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, what sanctions do you think Justin Brownlee could potentially face as a result of this of his failed exam or his failed uh, doping test and how is the procedure like? All right, so when it comes to the sanctions, I think this was raised earlier by um, by the POC chair. The, the max is really two years for this, but it can be um, decreased to three months or even one month. Why? Because um, what we have here is carboxy THC, which is a substance of abuse. And under the WADA code, if you have tested with, you've been tested positive of carboxy THC, and you get to prove during the hearings with the cast that you took it um, out of competition and it had nothing to do with sports performance, you can be re your two years can be reduced to just three months, and it can even be reduced to one month um, suspension or ineligibility. If you do like an anti-doping seminar or training or do a bit of rehab for it, but how would so, he? How would he, attorney, fight for that? Um, as we know, Justin has been here, I think, in the Philippines, where obviously THC is a prohibited substance. So it's kind of like very iffy to admit to, you know, maybe I went to a party and inhaled something, or uh, would he be in a well, tight spot? Yeah, I, I'm sure they're, they're, they're thinking about that. But again, we, we want to separate the criminal charges with the 
with the doping violation or the alleged doping violation. So they're two different things. Um, we've been hearing a lot of things that say that uh, if you're a doper, you're a drug user. I, again, that doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. follow. Mm -hmm. um, because again, if indeed he got this through marijuana use or marijuana exposure, he might have gotten it like, exposed to this somewhere, not in the Philippines, therefore a criminal law system will not apply to it. Right? So it's uh, very different. Right? So how he's going to raise these arguments. So again, um, the one who's supposed to rule over this is the Court of Arbitration of Sport Anti-Doping Division. You will have a hearing. You will have a hearing, and it will be online. So that's where he can raise his his arguments and his um, whatever evidence he has on his side. Okay. Attorney Miki, which legal framework um, are we talking about when it comes to governing the Asian Games? Um, is it this, um, the IOC, FIBA? Uh, where do the suspensions apply? Okay. So the legal framework for this. So we have. Um, I guess we have three players that you want to talk about. First is the OCA, Olympic Council of Asia. They're the ones who organize uh, the Asian Games. Then you have the ITA, which is the International Testing Agency. Right? So they're the ones who tested. They're the ones who are doing the testing. And then you have WADA, which, um, which has the code. Right? So that's what everyone is talking about. Mm -hmm. ITA does the testing, implementing the WADA code. Right? So the rules that we're looking at here is the OCA anti-doping rule because that's the rules for anti-doping for the Asian game. So that's what we're looking for. So if anyone wants to know what the procedure will be, what the sanctions will be, mm -hmm. you look at that OCA anti-doping rule. Is carboxy right? THC not allowed everywhere? I saw actually some chatter online that said that it's not banned by the NBA. Uh, mm -hmm. Attorney, do you know, as far as you know, is that true? It's not uh, I'm not sure about NBA. the NBA, but it's it's... It's a prohibited substance in the WADA code, right? So the NBA doesn't necessarily follow the WADA code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The WA so WADA being the, the World, World Anti-Doping anti -doping anti -doping Agency. Agency. Yeah. Like, yeah. Speaking so, of, um, go, go ahead. So um, you, you have international federations, international bodies. It's up to them if they want to sign into the WADA code, right? And everyone signs into the WADA code. FIBA, FIFA, mm -hmm. FIVB. NBA, it's not an international federation, so they have a choice not to. So it's really voluntary. But it's not really voluntary because it gives legitimacy to your international federation. We were reading the rules a while ago that uh, there needs to be at least two players who test positive for the medal to be taken away. Um, which rules are we reading here? Okay, so for the rules, that's the OCA, anti-doping rule. Union. And it's actually more than two players. Not two players, more than uh, two players. More, so than, more than two more players. More than two players. Okay. okay. Having said that, um, so uh, Bumble Tolentino is right and we get to keep our gold Confirmed medal. Confirmed yun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, but, so going back to, to Justin Brownlee, um, there is, of course, a chance to appeal by October 19. Um, how would that... I mean, we already reported on the process, right? So he could have sample be retested or he could opt not to. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk us through which one is better or what the difference would be if he takes one over the other, one option over the other? Well, I, I would advise to just open sample B as well because if sample B doesn't have the prohibited substance, then automatically the anti-doping rule violation will be cast out, at least according to the OCA rule. Mm -hmm. Coach, Coach Jeanette, let's just presume no, that uh, there was a uh, carboxy THC, there was marijuana taken, how many days um, um, could he have taken the substance prior to the test uh, for detection? I mean, yeah. was, mm -hmm. do you think he was taking it presumably during the competition or parang even before? Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, lang, the exposure may have come from uh, medication as well. And then also to ano lang, to give clarity on when uh, THC is uh, prohibited, it's only in competition and not out of competition, mm -hmm. meaning when the athlete uh, is tested during out of competition. And even if that sample or the sample has um, shown positive results, hindi yun nire-report. Kasi 
in competition lang siya ban, no? Hindi out of competition. Now, gaano katagal naglilinger or nagsistay sa body ng isang tao yung traces or yung metabolite ng um, THC? Uh, it can stay actually for us uh, around 30 days or more, depende sa um, kakayanan ng body ng isang tao to excrete that uh, that um, substance, no? Ang ang concern lang dito is the THC can uh, linger or it stays in the body fat mas matagal. So alimbawa, some of it can be excreted through urine, but majority of it will be will stay in the body and gets reabsorbed. Na absorb so, so mas tumatagal ng tumatagal. So wala tayong assurance. It's actually on an individual case to case basis kung gaano katagal or kabilis maka-clear, maki-clear yung substance from the body of that person exposed to um, cannabis or uh, merong metabolite ng THC. And then they so, could have so, taken yeah, it. Magkaiba yung prior, in-competition yeah. prohib- uh-huh. prohibited substances and yeah. out of competition uh-huh. prohibited yeah. substances. Then, meron naman na both in and out of competition parehas uh-huh. prohibited ang uh-huh. isang okay, substance. Got it. And then these, Just to uh, clarify. And then... Um, these tests, how sensitive are they? Would they have picked up even trace amounts of carboxy THC or there's a threshold? Yes, there is a threshold. In terms of sensitivity, uh, napaka-advanced ang technology na ginagamit ng uh, testers natin, ng ITA. Actually, um, lag- lagi yan silang may research. No? Pagdating sa testing procedures, protocols, and even yung um, uh, to, um, panels na ginagamit nila. Uh, with regards to the threshold, um, ang threshold limit is 15 nanograms per milliliter. Yun, yun dapat ang value na ma-meet para ma-consider na adverse analytical finding ang sample or positive yung sample na binigay for that particular uh, substance, for THC. So 15 nanograms per ml. Um, kung ito ay passive exposure lang, meaning halimbawa na inhale mo lang siya, no na may mga kasama ka na, gum- na gumagamit for example ng uh, marijuana na inhale mo lang uh, it's very ano um medyo mababa yung likelihood na aabot ka sa 15 um, nanograms per milliliter so talagang ang ano dito is probably sa medication talaga siya oh, okay. yung exposure so we really have to trace kung ano yung mga medicines na uh, ininom ni JB at ma-evaluate natin ang mabuti Thank you so much for trying, clarifying that for us. Sports lawyer attorney Mickey Ingles and sports nutrition coach Janet Aro. I was uh, with uh, SBB President Manny Pangilina a while ago and he said, um, let's stick to the facts of this case. But uh, we did agree that sadly, this does cast a shadow on over the Asian gold, games over gold. That so win. Was very, the, very over that sad historic that. win. Oh my. Well, uh, I suppose by October 19, that's already next week, we will find out uh, which way uh, the, the SBP and Justin Brownlee, you know, what they decide to do about the appeal. Through uh, those interviews, we found out um, how, uh, what defenses could be made still. Mm. Alright, we're going to pause right now for a very quick break. Right after that, yet another Filipino has been confirmed dead in the war in the Middle East, while Israel has ordered more than a million civilians out of Gaza within 24 hours. The latest on the conflict when the big story returns.
Welcome back. You're still watching the big story here on One News. The Foreign Affairs Department has confirmed a third Filipino casualty in the war between Hamas and Israel. She was among those who died in the Supernova Festival attack that ended in a massacre on October 7. Here's what the DFA said. I regret to inform you that, yes, it is confirmed there is a third Filipino casualty. A 49-year-old woman from Negros Occidental. Her family is aware, the president is aware. And uh, the, M the Philippine government, of course, is working, yes, is working uh, with a family, the embassy in Israel is in touch with the sisters who are in Kuwait, actually, uh, for the repatriation of remains. The DFA has yet to release the name of the third casualty, but this family from a town in Negros Occidental announced that they are grieving the death of their loved one in Israel, a caregiver named Loretta Lori Villarin Alacre. Lori's sister, uh, Aileen, confirmed the news on Facebook, saying in her caption that it's very difficult for her and her family to accept that Lori died unexpectedly. Aileen also told News 5 that on Saturday, Lori was fetched by her Chinese boyfriend at around 6 in the morning to attend the music festival. Aileen tried calling Lori at around 3 in the afternoon that same day, but was already out of reach. Before Lori's death was confirmed, her employer also posted on social media asking for the whereabouts of her caregiver, who had been her employee for the last six years. She said Lori was last seen with her partner at Netibot, Ashkelon, where they attended the music festival. Lori's partner was brought to the hospital after being shot in the back, but he said he had no information on Lori's whereabouts. So it's been exactly, what, seven days since the Today is the seventh day. And according to the DFA, 92 Filipinos out of the 131 residing in the Gaza Strip are now calling for repatriation, but they couldn't leave their shelters because all borders in Gaza remain closed. So the DFA naman said na pagbukas ng humanitarian corridor, then the Filipinos could remain at the border to fix their documents so that they can come back to the Philippines. But there is a but. There their is a big but. The Palestinian husbands um, are unlikely to be able to join their Filipino partners. The DFA said that they can't guarantee whether Israel or Egypt will allow that. And also, there's the fact that Israel is preparing for a ground offensive. Mm -hmm. They've already called up all yeah. their reservists, 300,000 of them. They've given the Palestinian side 24 hours to move more than one million civilians out of uh, the southern part but of Gaza. How? Right? I mean, how? Where because will it's they sealed go? off. Where will they go? Yeah. Exactly. It, it, and they, they said go up to the north, right? So it's a clear sign that they're preparing to um, invade the southern portion. The UN has already called, uh, or is trying to push back, right? They're telling Israel to rethink. Um, this and saying that there's there's bound to be devastating humanitarian consequences if they push ahead with this ground offensive. Well, um, as for our Kababayan still in Israel, there are outside of the Gaza Strip, there are 22 more Filipinos in other mm -hmm. parts of Israel. They're also requesting, we're requesting to come back to the Philippines, not because of the conflict, but because they've already lost their jobs. Eight of them will be in the first batch of repatriation, which has been set for October 16. According to the DFA, they want to finish all repatriations by this month. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, in a sectoral meeting held by President Marcos in Manacanang Thursday, he reiterated the government's efforts in providing assistance to Filipinos affected by the conflict. He also urges all concerned agencies, particularly the DFW and OWA, to come up with strong repatriation plans and explore all evacuation strategies to assist those affected. Now, this morning, there was troubling news also um, that um, so, uh, the Muslims were being called to stand up for um, with their um, Muslim brothers. Mm -hmm. So if this becomes to a regional conflict, mm -hmm. a larger scale it's conflict, it's slowly that is spreading, spreading outwards yes. already. Right? They've shelled Lebanon, uh, the southern the border with Lebanon. And Hezbollah has already yeah. started acting up. Then Kanina, yung al yung mosque again, Al Aqsa Al Aqsa Mosque, mosque again. Uh, Israeli soldiers were all there and they were disrupting, you know, Friday is a big day for worship. I think for the question is, when does this end, right? Mm. 
Well, meanwhile, a friend of Paul Castelvi, one of the three Filipinos confirmed to have died in the war, was confirmed alive. He is still recovering in the hospital after being accidentally shot by the Israeli army while hiding in a bomb shelter. His story in this report by Reynel Pawit. The southern part of Israel woke to consecutive explosions launched by the Hamas group on Saturday. Many Israelis have either been taken into hostage or murdered. Among them is the employer of Filipino Joey Pagsulingan, a caregiver at Kibbutz Berry. On Monday, a photo of Joey went viral, alive but with his left arm wrapped in a bandage. Owa initially identified him as Jalienor Pacheco, one of those allegedly abducted by Hamas. But Pacheco's wife said that the man in the photo is not her missing husband. Five days later, Joey's identity and whereabouts have been confirmed. He is found to be a friend of Paul Castelvi, one of the three Filipino casualties of the Hamas-Israel war. Joey recalled that when the attack escalated, he immediately advised his employer to come and hide in a bomb shelter. But his employer refused. After a few hours, his employer was killed while members of Hamas tried to open the door to the safe room. With the mask still outside the room, Joey kept holding the door shut throughout the day. Nung hindi nila mabuksan yung pintuan, uh, ang ginawa nila, sinunog nila yung bahay. So pag sunog nila ang bahay, di pumapasok yung usok. Tinakpan ko yung sa babaan ng pinto. May towel na ano, tapos may, may tubig dun na nabot ko. To Joey's relief, the fire did not spread throughout the property. But come night time, some men tried to open his door again. He thought it was another group of Hamas militants. Ang mga sundalo, sinong andyan, sabi nila, sinong andyan, hindi ako umimik, basta, pero hawak ko yung pintuan talaga, hawak mo yung hawakan ng pintuan. Nakasanggal ako dun sa isang pintuan na hawak-hawak ko talaga. Ano, eh ngayon, nung walang umimik, ang ginawa ng mga sundalo, binaril nila yung pintuan. Ang laki, parang, hindi ko alam kung hindi kasi ako marunong tumingin ng, ano, ang lakas ng... After mistakenly shooting Joey, the Israeli soldiers immediately took him to the hospital. His gunshot wound was so bad that Joey is now set to undergo a fourth operation to save his left arm. Ang nagligtas sa kanya na hindi siya talaga binitawan, di ba? Mula na baril sa sa may pintuan, hindi pa lang sinasadya. So di nala siya ang kasama ng ay tagbabarilan di. Pinatransport siya hanggang, hanggang sa madalas siya sa ospital. So, uh, ang katulad ng sinabi ko kanina, uh, huwag niyang alalahanin yung mga gastusin dyan. Meanwhile, at least three Filipinos in Israel remain missing, including Jelianor Pacheco. His wife is still at the OWA shelter, waiting for updates and hoping that he will be found alive. Maasa ako na sana makabalik ka sa lalong madaling panahon. Yung ano, yung, yung kambal ko po, na, lagi po silang ano, eh, nagtatanong eh. eh. Nararamdaman ko rin po yung ano nila kasi nakikita ko rin po yung mga ano, nagpo-post sila na about sa ano, sa papa nila. Kaya yun po, tinatanong po nila kung nasan na po. The Philippine government is preparing for the repatriation of Filipinos in Israel. Based on the OWA's latest report, nine communities in Israel are still under monitoring due to continuing unrest. Rainiel Pawid, We Are One News. We're going to pause for a quick one right now, but right after that, more and more government agencies falling victim to hacking. Are the hackers getting more sophisticated or we're just unable to keep up? We'll discuss this and how to protect yourself with cybersecurity advocate Art Samaniego. Keep it here at One News.
back. You're still watching Big Story here in my news. President Marcos is dismayed by the cons consecutive data breaches at different government agencies to say the least. Currently, at least three agencies have been confirmed to have been targeted by hackers. As we know, this all started with PhilHealth, which was attacked by the international Medusa ransomware on September 22, followed by the data leak at the Philippine Statistics Authority earlier this week. Now, it was found that a Facebook page called Diablox Phantom No. 2 posted 25 links online over the weekend, most of which led to data taken from the PSA. However, three of the links revealed that information appeared to have also been mined from the Department of Science and Technology and the Philippine National Police. The OST Secretary Renato Solidum confirmed that they were indeed hacked, but he says the hackers were only able to infiltrate their one expert portal. Solidum says the hackers breached the website system on August 31, but he notes that this is separate from their main website, which is why he said that they were able to swiftly resolve the matter. So what information did the affected DOSD site contain? Here's what Solidum said. These data contained some publicly listed names of technical experts, their uh, addresses, the email addresses, which are actually publicly available. Mm -hmm. So in essence, the purpose of the one expert is to popularize the different experts for different fields where the public can uh, go to and consult with. Mm -hmm. So wala namang sensitive data doon kasi pinapublicize nga namin. So the News 5 team tried to reach out to the PNP regarding the matter, but they have yet to respond. The DICT also earlier said that shady groups may be using outdated data from previous hacks to create more panic. Now, how concerning are these data breaches in government agencies? Here to help us make sense of things is cybersecurity enthusiast and Manila Bulletin tech editor Art Samaniego. Art, thanks for joining us tonight, even... Uh, Though you don't have good internet connections, Art, can you shed some? Oh, nga eh. Ano bang nagyare? Local actors din ba? Itong uh, sinasabi ng DICT na hack sa DOST at eto ring sa PNP. Because we were talking to uh, DICT under Secretary Jeffrey D yesterday, and yes, yeah, sabi niya, hello. Yes. Yes. Yun nga, sabi niya, parang yung sa PSA daw ay local hackers. What do you know? Uh, yeah. uh, yung yung uh, attacker ng PhilHealth ay uh, an international cybercrime group. Uh, yung sa PSA, they're local hackers. So I think there's their kids uh, trying to brag their uh, exploits. Okay, kids. And, uh, Oh, ma ma mga bata, mga, mga bata to, or mga mga bagong natututong uh, mga hack. So when you when you check the profile of this this hacker, they they can uh, well well they just na uh, newly well parang bagong cybersecurity guys na uh, natutong mga hack and uh, they're bragging about their exploits, kung sino sino control nila. So and they're they're even claiming that they have 42 billion, so which is impossible, a 42 billion records. Uh, it's, it's impossible. So, uh, of all the hacks that are uh, happening now, uh, only the the hack of the field health uh, is a serious cybersecurity incident for now, uh, uh, based on the information we have. Okay, so, um, sinasabi kasi ng PSA that uh, they're considering the fact that it might be an inside job. Um, pero sa tingin mo, mga kids talaga yan, mga hacking enthusiasts? Uh, um, in every cybersecurity incident, uh, we ne we never rule out uh, inside job. Pero uh, this time, uh, hindi siya ano eh, mukhang, mukhang hindi inside job. So, uh, yung, yung profile nga nun pa job lock or job lock uh, there are kids who, like, who, who want to brag that they're uh, good in their craft. Are, um, are, are the hackers really that good? Because when we talk to the agencies, they keep telling us that hindi lang tayo mga Pinoy. Um, even around the world, even the big um, tech companies, they get hacked. 
Um, are, are we really that vulnerable and how do other agencies protect themselves now seeing that there seems to be a trend of hacks? So, lahat ng mga countries, uh, U.S. Uh, federal uh, agencies na half and more than 100 uh, private uh, U.S. companies were, were hacked recently. Uh, Israel was hacked by uh, Iran, yung train system nila, and hacked, and uh, U.S. and Japan announced that uh, Chinese hackers are attacking uh, their system. Uh, Canada was attacked by India recently. Mm -mm. So, ito, uh, hindi siya nangyayari sa Pilipinas lang. Ibig sabihin nito, lahat ng vulnerable country, lahat ng vulnerable agency, and all vulnerable organizations are targets of these hackers. So, uh, nangyayari sa lahat ito. Uh, sa Pilipinas naman, uh, like what happened to Field Health, it was a human error. Kasi, their antivirus uh, expired April pa. And they're using the reason that it's the procurement process na matagal daw sa Pilipinas, kaya hindi nila na-update yung antivirus. Hmm. But, so, ang vulnerability, uh, uh, let, let's remember that the, the weakest link of any cybersecurity posture is the human uh, human being, the human user. So, kahit gano'n pakatatag yung cybersecurity posture mo, if your user will still click link, will still click malicious link, mahahak ka pa rin. Pero in the case of real health, uh, admin error, they did not uh, update their antivirus. All right. Uh, maraming salamat sa oras mo ngayong gabi. Thanks for joining us, cybersecurity analyst or cybersecurity enthusiast and Manila Bulletin tech editor, Art Samaniek. Over in Manila, a supposed case of road rage led to a traffic incident that killed one person. Marlene Alcaide has that report. It seemed like a normal day along Mel Lopez Boulevard in Manila on Thursday until this scene caught by CCTV camera. A trailer truck hitting the left side of this aluminum van and dragging its driver out on the road. The driver, identified as Benjamin Bagtas, was rushed to the hospital but eventually died. According to the victim's companion, it all started after the trailer truck hit the aluminum van side mirror along C3 Navotas. Pagdating sa may babaan, rampahan ng galing ng, ano, ng expressway, kinat kami ng trailer. Ngayon, pumasok yung side mirror namin sa, ano, nasagi, yung side mirror namin. Tapos dimiretso yung truck. Ngayon, inayos ko. Sumigaw yung driver ko na, anong problema mo? Alam ko hindi narinig ng driver kasi nakasara yung, ano, yung salamin niya. Tapos tinignan ko yung driver. Dimiretso ko lang siya. The tension between the two drivers continued until they reached Mel Lopez Boulevard. That's when the victim stepped out of the van to talk to the driver of the trailer truck. Wala namang hindi kasi napalitan ng salita na ano, nagbumuran, wala. Tapos habulan lang, gitgitan lang. Tapos nung pag, par, pagparada ng truck ng driver ko, kasama ko, pagbaba na pagbaba niya, tsaka sa sinalpok. Tagang niliko yung trailer niya, papunta sa kanya. The victim's companion also believes that the suspect intentionally hit Bagtas. Sadya talaga. Kasi, kasi alam niya na may tao eh. Bakit niya pa biglang niliko yung truck? Yung ulo ng truck na papunta sa tao na katayo sa biktima. But the driver of the trailer truck said it was an accident. Sa pamilya po ng na Disgrasya, na napatay ko. Imingi po ako ng pasinsya, kapatawaran na sana po. Mapatawad nila ako sa nagawa ko. Dahil sa akin, nawalan sila ng mahal sa buhay. Aksidente lang po talaga. The suspect is now under the custody of the Manila police facing a murder complaint. The victim's family is also determined to file charges. They also want his license revoked. Mukhang basahan yung asawa ko na tinapon. Sadya talaga. Ang daming paraan para uiwasan yung asawa ko. Pero bakit kinabig niya pa yung manipela niya papunta sa truck ng asawa ko? Hindi naman po ubra yung sorry. Dahil inisip niya rin po kung may pamilya siya, may iiwanan. Hindi naman po aksidente yung ginawa niya kasi. 
Talagang tinuluyan yung tatay ko eh. The trailer trucks company also vowed to extend help to the victim's family, saying they do not tolerate such incidents. For News 5, Marlene Alcaide, We Are One News. Up next, a strong quake rocked Batangas earlier this morning, disrupting work, classes, and even one of our live TV shows. The details when we return. Welcome back. You're still watching The Big Story here on One News. Siyempre, another major event during this crazy Friday the 13th. The magnitude 5 earthquake off of Batangas that shook parts of southern Luzon and Metro Manila. In Barangay Balisong in Taal, Batangas, CCTV footage caught the intense shaking during the earthquake which led towns in Batangas to suspend classes. The tremor was also felt in the neighboring province of Cavite. This video you're now seeing shows City Hall employees quickly evacuating the building. This earthquake was also felt in Laguna. St. Vincent College's classes in Cabuyao decided to suspend classes in the afternoon to inspect buildings. And of course, even here in Metro Manila, the earthquake was very much felt. In fact, the broadcast of One News' agenda, hosted by Cito Beltran, stopped for a bit due to the tremors. Let's take a look at that. If you feel uh, you need to vacate, let me know. Yes, um, I, I feel something's shaking. Can I stop for one second to check with my security? Okay, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, they're just doing a check at the embassy because uh, uh, apparently they have, uh, they think there may have been an earthquake. According to FIVOX, this earthquake was caused by the movement of the Batangas Fault, which they said is not too much of a concern as they did not monitor any significant damage. And before we go, planchado na ba lahat ng mga travels niyo for 2024? No, I'm a last minute planner. So. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Actually, all of us. But, <laughs> eto na lang, no? Because this was also all over the internet. So, in case you missed it, Malacanang has already released the list of holidays for next ah, year. This one. So, kung hindi napansin yun today, our big picture tonight is Proclamation 368 from the Office of the President. It contains the list of regular and special holidays for next year. But noticeably missing in this list is the EDSA People Power Anniversary commemorated every 25 or Feb 25. Mm -hmm. So why is this a big deal? Well, EDSA Day has always been considered a special non-working holiday in the past. The Office of the President did issue a statement saying it maintains respect for the commemoration of the EDSA People Power Revolution. The office goes on to explain that it was not included in the holidays list because it falls on a Sunday and would have, quote, minimal socioeconomic impact, unquote, since it coincides with a rest day. But earlier this year, President Marcos declared Feb 24 a special non-working day to commemorate the EDSA People Power Anniversary, which fell on a Saturday. Now, this move was supposedly part of the administration's push to promote holiday economics. 
Siyempre, yung mga matutulis yung mata, they also no noticed that December 8th, mm -hmm. which is uh, Mama Mary's birthday. That's right. right? They also it falls so... on a Sunday. Yes. Yeah. Was but declared. It, it was, was also in the list. Yeah. This uh, image we're looking at is a headline from international news outlets, which also pointed out that actually, uh, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of Mary fell on a Sunday mm -hmm. last year, but was included in the holidays list. So, I, I guess people don't know what to make of that, right? Pero, napansin ko, I looked at the list, nandun pa naman, ano, yung Ninoy Aquino Day on August 21. Well, why is that important? I mean, because it affects also the salary of those who have worked even on, on a Sunday. Sunday. That's yes. true. So, it that's does. why napapansin. But really, what Malaga. social media is saying, I mean, obviously, Social media likes to debate things. They're wondering whether there was something more behind this, yes. mm -hmm. right? Whether it started last year, eh? Oh, minuvnya to Feb 24, mm -hmm. up to Feb 25, and the argument is you can't just move holidays. Yeah, but even way in back, the name of holiday economics, you can. You can, like yeah. Gloria Macapagal. Yeah. Right. So Especially that's the because argument people of are use. more, I mean, vigilant about these things uh, with this administration, mm -hmm. right? But. Tayo niya tayo masadong napapan sa mga holiday kasi may balita diba? Yes. Oo, oh, oh. so na tayo pumapasok on special days and speaking yeah. of, I'd like to commend our birthday girl for coming in today <laughs> on Friday. <laughs> and because of that, it's my holiday. Of course, I'm coming it's in. It's your special day. Happy Great birthday to, to you. you. <laughs> Happy birthday, Happy Regina. Birthday. No. To of course, our it's not, it's not a holiday. Of course, Regina's I have to come in. King. How of course, you have to come in and... Uh, <laughs> we are not talking age. Sorry, girls. Thank you. Wait, That's wait, so wait. Sweet. What's your birthday wish and what do you plan to do? You can tell us or it's all come true. This time around, I can. Okay. And I say this with 100% sincerity, which is really just world peace, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because when you look back at the slate of news that we've had this week, the last 10 days, it's just been so heavy. Mm -hmm. That interview that we did this week mm -hmm. with that... With a Maya the, prison. With the Israeli yeah. survivor of the music Super festival. I mean, that that was just really, really difficult to do, right? Well, so. Raj, I commend you for using your birthday wish for <laughs> the greater good. No, it's true, yeah. I mean, just like, you know, I, I never thought in my whole lifetime of being a journalist that we would be covering wars. But now mm -hmm. we're talking about two, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Ongoing, yes. huge conflicts. One in Ukraine, one in Israel. So, yeah. Uh, cheers to that. <laughs> In between all of that, we celebrate oh your birthday. Oh, Please do you. have a good weekend. Blow all right, before <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna end the show until you blow. <laughs> I have like, to blow it to like <laughs> on air. Okay, or thank like, you. Uh, there you go. Thank Happy you. birthday! <laughs> thank that's you guys. from everyone here on the big story. All right, that's it for the show tonight. Happy Friday. <laughs> we have on news all sides all the time. Oh right. yeah. Oh, it's Friday the 13th. It's a special day. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a good night.